Hello and welcome to our video, summarizing all you need to know about the novel Wuthering Heights by Emily Bronte. My name is Barney and in this video we will look at Wuthering Heights, specifically beginning with some context related to the author Emily Bronte, as well as ideas at the time this novel was written that you will need to be aware of. We will then look into the novel's plot in detail and examine the necessary information you will need to know about it before looking at each character in the novel in depth, key themes related to this novel, as well as important symbols. This video is really useful, especially if you are studying Wuthering Heights as part of your English coursework or exams, as we will go into the details you need to know to get top marks. So let's get started. Starting with the plot summary, Mr Lockwood, an out-of-towner renting an estate called Thrushcross Grange, twice visits his landlord, Mr Heathcliff, who lives at a nearby manor called Wuthering Heights. During the first visit, Heathcliff is gruff but compelling. During the second, Lockwood meets other mysterious residents of Wuthering Heights, is attacked by dogs when he tries to leave, and endures a ghostly visitation overnight. Lockwood asks the housekeeper at the Grange, Ellen Dean, also known as Nellie, to tell him about Heathcliff and Wuthering Heights. She recounts a complicated story of two families, the Earnshaws and the Lintons. Mr. Earnshaw, a gentleman, owns Wuthering Heights. He has two children, Hindley and Catherine, and adopts a third, Heathcliff. Hindley is jealous of Heathcliff because both his father and his sister are very fond of the youngster. To avoid strife, Mr. Earnshaw sends Hindley away to college, during which time Catherine and Heathcliff become extremely close. Mr. Earnshaw dies and Hindley, with a new wife, returns to claim Wuthering Heights. Still bitter, Hindley forces Heathcliff to give up his education and treats him like a servant. Hindley's wife dies soon after giving birth to a baby boy, Herdon. However, Hindley descends into alcoholism, though he continues to abuse and mistreat Heathcliff. Meanwhile, Heathcliff and Catherine grow interested in the Lintons, a well-to-do family who live at Thrushcross Grange. The Lintons have two children, Edgar and Isabella, who seem very cultured and refined to the somewhat wild inhabitants of Wuthering Heights. After suffering an injury while spying on the Lintons, Catherine Earnshaw spends five weeks with the Lintons, becoming close to Edgar. She finds Edgar's wealth and blonde beauty enticing, yet her feelings for Heathcliff are far more passionate. Even so, Catherine tells Nellie that she can't marry Heathcliff because of how Hindley has degraded him. Heathcliff overhears Catherine and flees Wuthering Heights that night. In Heathcliff's absence, a devastated Catherine marries Edgar Linton and moves to Thrushcross Grange. All is well until Heathcliff returns, now rich and dignified, but just as wild and ferocious. Catherine is thrilled to see Heathcliff again. Edgar doesn't share her excitement. He tries to keep them apart, but Catherine continues to see Heathcliff despite her husband's disapproval. Heathcliff, meanwhile, moves into Wuthering Heights. Hindley, who has become a gambler, welcomes Heathcliff into his home because he lusts after Heathcliff's money. Soon after, Catherine reveals to Heathcliff that Isabella has a crush on him. Not long after that, she observes the two of them embracing. The developing romance leads to a conflict between Edgar and Heathcliff, after which Edgar demands that Catherine choose between the two of them. Catherine responds by locking herself into her room and refusing to eat for three days. On the third day, she is frenzied and delusional and believes herself near death. That same night, Heathcliff elopes with Isabella. Edgar nurses Catherine for two months. Her health improves somewhat, though not completely. She also discovers that she is pregnant. At Wuthering Heights, Heathcliff treats Isabella terribly from the moment after their wedding. Edgar, however, refuses to have any contact with Isabella and fears that Heathcliff wed Isabella solely as a way to try to take Thrushcross Grange from the Lintons. Two months after the wedding, Heathcliff, concerned about Catherine's health, pays a surprise visit to Thrushcross Grange while Edgar is away. In a tearful reunion, Heathcliff and Catherine profess their continuing and eternal love for each other, but Edgar soon returns 
and Catherine collapses. That night, Catherine gives birth to a girl, Kathy, and dies a few hours later. Catherine is buried in a spot overlooking the moors where she used to play with Heathcliff as a child. Two days later, Isabella escapes from Withering Heights and goes to town outside of London where she gives birth to Heathcliff's son, Linton. Hindley dies six months later, so deeply in debt to Heathcliff that Heathcliff becomes the owner of Wuthering Heights. Heathcliff then places Hareton into the same kind of servitude into which Henley once placed him. Twelve years pass. Cathy grows into a beautiful young woman while Hareton grows into a rough youth. Isabella dies and Edgar brings Linton back to Thrushcross Grange, but Heathcliff insists that Linton come to live with him at Wuthering Heights. Heathcliff then carefully and deliberately cultivates a friendship between the weak and spineless Linton and the strong-willed Cathy. Though Edgar at first forbids Cathy from seeing Linton at all, as his own health fails, he relents and allows her to meet with Linton at Thrushcross Grange or on the moors. One day, while meeting with Linton on the moors, Heathcliff forces Cathy and Nellie to return with him and Linton to Wuthering Heights. He confines Cathy and Nellie in the house until Cathy marries Linton, which she ultimately does. Cathy escapes from Wuthering Heights long enough to be with her father as he dies, but, he, but is soon taken back to Wuthering Heights by Heathcliff. Edgar is buried next to Catherine. Linton dies soon after that and Heathcliff, because of careful legal manoeuvrings, now owns both Wuthering Heights and Thrushcross Grange. Cathy reluctantly lives with Heathcliff and Hareton, whom she constantly mocks for his illiteracy at Wuthering Heights. This brings the story up to the present, when Lockwood has rented Thrush Thrushcross Grange. Lockwood goes back to London, but passes through the region six months later. Much to everyone's surprise, Cathy and Hareton have fallen in love. Cathy has realised Hareton's nobility and kindness beneath his lack of education. Heathcliff, who sees a strong resemblance in both Hareton and Cathy to Catherine, no longer feels the need for revenge. He dies and is buried beside Catherine, on the spot opposite where Edgar is buried. Cathy and Hareton, at last free of interfering adults, plan to marry and move to Thrushcross Grange. Moving on to the summary of chapters. Chapter 1 It is 1801. Mr. Lockwood writes in his diary that wanting solitude after unintentionally hurting a woman he admired because he dislikes showing of emotion, he has rented a house called Thrushcross Grange in the Yorkshire countryside. Soon after arriving, he visits his landlord, Mr. Heathcliff, whom he describes as a gruff yet noble, dark-skinned gypsy. Heathcliff lives in a manor called Wuthering Heights, which is named after the harsh winds that blow across the nearby moors. The house is strong and sturdy and has grotesque carvings around the front door. During this visit, Heathcliff is amused when Lockwood is nearly attacked after Heathcliff leaves him alone with a bunch of savage dogs. Yet Lockwood finds Heathcliff compelling and uninvited, announces that he will return soon. Chapter 2 Lockwood returns to Wuthering Heights the next day. As he arrives, it begins to snow. No one answers his knock at the door and an old servant with a heavy Yorkshire accent named Joseph tells him that Heathcliff is away. Eventually, a rough young man lets Lockwood in and brings him to a sitting room. In the room also is a beautiful but rather rude and haughty young woman. Soon after Heathcliff arrives, he scolds Lockwood for coming then begrudgingly invites him to dinner. During the meal, Lockwood learns that the young woman, whom he assumed was Heathcliff's wife, is the widow of Heathcliff's son, and the rough young man, whom Lockwood thought was Heathcliff's son, is Heathcliff's nephew. The meal is awkward. At one point, the young woman threatens to use witchcraft on Joseph the servant. The snow also turns to a blizzard, and while discussing how Lockwood will get home, the woman tells Heathcliff that he, if he lets Lockwood leave alone, she hopes Lockwood's ghost will haunt him. Chapter 3 Zillah brings Lockwood to a room that Heathcliff usually doesn't allow anyone to stay in. Left alone, Lockwood notices three names scratched into the paint of the bed. Catherine Earnshaw, Catherine Heathcliff and Catherine Linton. 
Lockwood also finds a 25-year-old diary written by Catherine Earnshaw. He reads an entry from a time just after her father died, in which her older brother Hindley makes Catherine and Heathcliff listen to Joseph's dull sermons. From the entry, it's clear that Hindley hated Heathcliff, but that Catherine and Heathcliff were close. That night, Lockwood has a nightmare in which he breaks a window to get some air, and a child grabs his hand. She says her name is Catherine Linton and begs to enter, claiming she's been trying to get in for 20 years. Lockwood fights her and frees himself. She continues to beg and cries out. His yell carries into the real world. Heathcliff hears it and comes running. He's upset to find Lockwood in the room, while Lockwood's upset over the ghost. Lockwood describes his nightmare to Heathcliff, who becomes livid when Lockwood says the dream wife deserves to be punished. Heathcliff, sobbing, opens the window and shuts for Catherine to come in. The next morning, Heathcliff escorts Lockwood home. The servants of Thrushcross Grange are overjoyed to see Lockwood. They feared he'd died in the storm. But Lockwood, in no mood for company, locks himself in the study. Chapter 4 Back at Thrushcross Grange, Lockwood starts feeling lonely and asks his housekeeper, Nellie Dean, to tell him about Heathcliff and Wuthering Heights. Nellie Dean says she grew up at Wuthering Heights with Hindley and Catherine Earnshaw and tells Lockwood that Heathcliff has a dead son and is rich enough to live in a house grander than Wuthering Heights. She also explains that the young woman he met at Wuthering Heights is named Cathy and is the daughter of Catherine Earnshaw and the previous tenant of Thrushcross Grange, Edgar Linton. Additionally, she says that Hareton is the last of the Earnshaws, a very old family. The point of view shifts from Lockwood to Nellie as she tells her story. Mr. Earnshaw, the former master of Wuthering Heights, was a strict but kind man. When Nellie was little, he returned from a business trip to Liverpool with Heathcliff, an orphan boy he'd found on the street. Earnshaw's daughter, Catherine, took to her foster brother almost immediately, but Earnshaw's son, Hindley, hated him. Hindley was jealous of his father's affection for Heathcliff and expressed his jealousy by bullying him. Heathcliff responded with silence. Only Mrs. Earnshaw, Earnshaw's wife, took Hindley's side against Heathcliff, but she died just two years after Heathcliff arrived. Chapter 5 Time passes. Mr. Earnshaw's health deteriorates and he becomes even less accepting of Hindley's behaviour toward Heathcliff. He sends Hindley away to college, allowing Catherine and Heathcliff to grow together. As Mr. Earnshaw nears death, he becomes interested in Joseph's harsh and rigid religious beliefs. Meanwhile, to her father's dismay, Catherine is constantly going on adventures with Heathcliff and getting into trouble. Though she teases her father about this, she loves him deeply and is the one holding him when he dies. On the stormy night of Mr. Earnshaw's death, Catherine and Heathcliff console each other. They talk of heaven, imagining it as a beautiful place. Chapter 6 Hindley returns from his father's funeral. He brings with him his somewhat silly, and ineffectual wife, Frances. As his father's heir, Hindley is now master of Wuthering Heights and makes immediate changes, such as moving the servants to the backwaters. He also forces Heathcliff to give up his education and instead to work in the fields. Yet for the most part, Hindley ignores both Heathcliff and Catherine, who escape their domineering brother by escaping to go to play on the moors. One day, Heathcliff and Catherine don't return from one of their adventures and Hindley orders that they be locked out. Nellie, though, waits up for them, and she is there when Heathcliff comes back alone. He tells Nellie that he and Catherine had been at Thrushcross Grange, spying on Edgar and Isabella Linton. Heathcliff was impressed by their house, and he thought the Linton children were idiots. When he, when he and Catherine laughed aloud at them, the Lintons realised someone was outside. As Heathcliff and Catherine tried to escape, the Linton's dog, Skulker, got them and bit Catherine's foot. When the Lintons realise that Catherine is from Wuthering Heights, they bring her inside and insist that Catherine stay with them while she heals. But they are shocked at Heathcliff's rough clothes and language and refuse to let him stay with Catherine. Before leaving, Heathcliff spies on them. He sees how the Lintons fuss over Catherine and how much she likes the attention. 
The next day, Mr. Linton goes to Wuthering Heights and berates Hindley for letting Catherine run wild. Ashamed, Hindley blames Heathcliff and says that Heathcliff may, may no longer see or talk to Catherine. Chapter 7 Catherine stays at Thrushcross Grange for five weeks. Mrs. Linton spends the time teaching her how to be a proper young lady. Catherine returns around Christmas wearing a beautiful dress. Hindley allows Heathcliff to greet her like the other servants. Catherine kisses Heathcliff hello but teases that he is dirty compared to Edgar. Heathcliff walks out, growling that he'll be as dirty as he likes. Edgar and Isabella come to Wuthering Heights for Christmas. Heathcliff allows Nelly to make him presentable, but it turns out that Mrs. Linton allowed her children to come only on the condition that they be kept away from Heathcliff. Hindley sees Heathcliff to the kitchen. Before he can go, Edgar makes a disparaging comment about Heathcliff's appearance, and Heathcliff throws applesauce in Edgar's face. Hindley locks Heathcliff in the attic. Catherine, though, thinks that both Edgar and Hindley mistreated Heathcliff and after dinner she slips away from the others to visit him. Nelly also takes pity on Heathcliff and brings him down to the kitchen for some food. While eating, Heathcliff tells Nelly that he is going to get revenge against Edgar. Nelly then breaks into her story to say that it is late and she must sleep. Lockwood insists that she continue the story right then. Chapter 8 Nelly continues her story. The following summer, Frances gave birth to a son, Hareton Earnshaw, but Frances died just a week later. Childbirth had aggravated a case of consumption that she had long suffered from. Hindley is devastated. He hands the baby over to Nelly to take care of. He turns to alcohol for comfort and takes out his grief on the servants, Catherine and especially Heathcliff. For his part, Heathcliff delights in Hindley's decline. Catherine remains in touch with the Lintons. When she's with them, she acts like a proper lady. But when with Heathcliff, she acts just as she used to. One day when Hindley's out, Heathcliff doesn't go to the fields and instead plans to spend the day with Catherine. But Catherine admits that she has invited Edgar and Isabella to come visit. Heathcliff comments on how much time Catherine has been spending with the Lintons. She retorts that it is because he, Heathcliff, is dumb and dull. Edgar arrives just then, alone. Heathcliff storms out. Catherine tells Nelly to leave the room since she wants to be alone with Edgar. Nelly refuses. Hindley had told her to chaperone Catherine. Furious, Catherine slaps and pinches Nelly and even shakes the crying Hareton. Edgar tries to step in, but Catherine boxes his ears. Shocked and defeated by Catherine's wild behaviour, Edgar rushes from the house. But as he leaves, he catches a glimpse of Catherine, and captured by her beauty, he returns. Chapter 9 That night, Hindley grabs Hatton from Nelly in a rage, but then accidentally drops the baby over the banister. Luckily, Heathcliff is at the bottom of the steps to catch Hatton without harm. Later, Catherine goes to Nelly in the kitchen. As Heathcliff listens, she tells Nelly that she has accepted Edgar's proposal of marriage, yet isn't sure she should have. Catherine describes a dream in which she was in heaven but didn't feel at home. When angels returned her to Wuthering Heights, she was relieved. She equates marrying Edgar to such a heaven, yet she also says that she cannot marry Heathcliff because Hindley has so degraded Heathcliff that marrying him would be like degrading herself. Furious and ashamed, Heathcliff leaves and therefore doesn't hear Catherine say that. Though she must marry Edgar, she loves Heathcliff more than anything and that nothing could interfere their relationship, not even marrying Edgar, because she and Heathcliff are essentially the same person. That night, in a storm, Heathcliff runs away from Wuthering Heights. Catherine discovers his absence and is distraught, searches for him all night in the rain, catching a fever in the process. The Lintons nurse Catherine through the fever at Thrushcross Grange, but Mr. and Mrs. Linton themselves come down with the sickness and die. Three years later, Heathcliff has still not returned, and Edgar and Catherine get married. Nelly leaves Hareton with Hindley and Joseph at Wuthering Heights and moves to Thrushcross Grange. Chapter 10 Lockwood falls ill for four weeks. Heathcliff visits him once during this time, 
after which Lockwood asks Nellie to tell him how Heathcliff made his fortune. Nellie doesn't know how Heathcliff made his money, but continues with her story. For about six months after Catherine's wedding, everything is peaceful at Thrushcross Grange, largely because the Lintons do whatever the imperious Catherine wants. Then one evening, Heathcliff appears at the Grange. Catherine is almost frantic with excitement. Edgar, however, is less pleased. He suggests they receive Heathcliff in the kitchen, but Catherine insists that they bring him into the parlour. As Heathcliff enters the parlour, Nellie notes that he looks imposing, mature and dignified, in contrast to his youthful roughness. Yet he still retains a kind of ferocity in his eyes. As Edgar, Heathcliff and Catherine talk, Heathcliff says that he returned hoping only to catch a glimpse of Catherine, exact revenge on Hindley and then kill himself. But Catherine's joy at seeing him has changed his mind. Edgar, con uncomfortable, interrupts to say that if they wait any longer, the tea will get cold. As he leaves, Heathcliff shocks Nellie when he tells her that he is staying at Wuthering Heights at Hindley's invitation. That night, Catherine awakens Nellie to tell her that she couldn't sleep from excitement. She says that she had praised Heathcliff to Edgar, but that Edgar had claimed to feel sick and even cried. Nellie advises Catherine to hide her feelings for Heathcliff and treasure her husband's love, but Catherine dismisses Edgar and Isabella as spoiled children. Nellie comments that it's actually the Lintons who humour Catherine. Catherine also tells Nellie how Heathcliff wound up staying at Wuthering Heights. He'd gone to Wuthering Heights to find Nellie and get information from her about Catherine. But instead, he found Hindley in the middle of a card game. During the game, it was clear Heathcliff had money, so Hindley invited him to stay. Heathcliff insisted on paying for the lodging. In the following days, Catherine and Isabella often visit the Heights, and Heathcliff regularly comes to the Grange. Isabella soon, soon develops a crush on Heathcliff. When she confes confesses it to Catherine, her sister-in-law warns her that Heathcliff is a friend whom she should stay away from. Nellie seconds his advice and adds that there are rumours that Heathcliff is lending Hindley money to support his gambling habit. The next day, Catherine humiliates Isabella by revealing her crush to Heathcliff when he visits. Isabella rushes from the room. Heathcliff expresses disdain for Isabella but notes that Isabella must be Edgar's heir. Nellie thinks Heathcliff is plotting something. Chapter 11 Not long afterward, Nellie stops by Wuthering Heights as she is walking past on some other errand and encounters her former charge, Hareton, who curses and throws stones at her. Hareton tells her that it was Heathcliff who taught him to curse and that Heathcliff also refused to allow Hareton to be educated. Heathcliff then appears and Nellie flees. The following day, Nellie and Catherine observe Heathcliff and Isabella embracing in the Granger's garden. Catherine confronts Heathcliff in the kitchen about his feelings for Isabella. She offers to convince Edgar to allow the marriage if Heathcliff truly loves Isabella, but Heathcliff answers that Catherine wronged him when she married Edgar, and that he plans to get revenge. Informed of the confrontation by Nellie, Edgar rushes in and orders Heathcliff to leave. Heathcliff refuses. Edgar moves to get the servants to come and help him remove Heathcliff, but Catherine forces Edgar to confront Heathcliff alone by locking the door into the house and throwing the key in the fire. Edgar at first hides his face, but Catherine taunts him and he punches the larger Heathcliff in the neck. Then he runs from the kitchen into the garden to get the servants. Deciding he can't fight off Edgar and a bunch of armed servants, Heathcliff leaves. Once Heathcliff is gone, Edgar furiously demands that Catherine choose between him and Heathcliff. Catherine refuses to talk to him and retreats to her room, where she stays for three days without eating anything. In the meantime, Edgar, distraught, tells Isabella to either stay away from Heathcliff or be disowned. Chapter 12 After three days, Catherine finally unlocks her door and allows Nellie to give her food. Catherine believes that she is dying and is distraught that Edgar has buried himself in his books instead of coming to her. Delirious, Catherine rambles about a time she spent on the moors with Heathcliff as a child and obsesses over death. Nellie refuses Catherine's request to open the window. She doesn't want Catherine to catch a chill. 
Catherine staggers to the window herself and opens it herself. She says that she can see Wuthering Heights and that, though she is going to die, she'll never be at rest until she is with Heathcliff. Edgar arrives and is appalled by Catherine's weak and frenzied condition. Nellie goes to get a doctor. When the doctor arrives and examines Catherine, he announces that he is optimis- optimistic that she'll recover. That same night, Isabella runs off with Heathcliff. Edgar, furious, refuses to attempt to get Isabella to come back. Instead, he says that Isabella is now his sister in name only. Not because I disown her, but because she has disowned me. Chapter 13 For two months, Edgar nurses Catherine, and though she improves somewhat, she never fully recovers her health. During that time, Catherine does learn, however, that she is pregnant. Edgar hopes the child is male so that the baby, rather than Isabella and Heathcliff, will inherit Thrushcross Grange. Six weeks after she ran away with and married Heathcliff, Isabella writes to Edgar, begging for forgiveness. Edgar doesn't answer the letter. Isabella next writes to Nellie. She says that she is living at Wuthering Heights and that her experience has been awful. Heathcliff has told her that since he can't go to get to Edgar to punish him for Catherine's illness, he'll take it out on Isabella instead. Hindley, Hareton and Joseph treat her just as badly. Isabella also writes that Hindley is completely unhinged and plans to kill Heathcliff and take his money. Isabella says that she has made a mistake, but knows it is too late to fix it. She begs Nellie to come visit her at Wuthering Heights. Chapter 14 Nellie goes to visit Wuthering Heights. Edgar, however, refuses Nellie's request to send with her a token of forgiveness to Isabella. At Wuthering Heights, Nellie barely gets to see Isabella at all. Instead, Heathcliff asks after Catherine's condition and then asks Nellie to help him see her, adding that were he in Edgar's place, he would never stop Catherine from seeing someone she wanted to see. Nellie refuses to help Heathcliff, who threatens to hold Nellie prisoner at Wuthering Heights and go to the Grange alone. Nellie gives in and agrees to carry a letter to Catherine from Heathcliff. Chapter 15 When Edgar goes to church, four days later, Nellie delivers Heathcliff's letter to Catherine, who is so weak that she can hardly hold it. Heathcliff walks into the room almost as soon as Nellie delivers the letter. Upon seeing him, Catherine says that he and Edgar have broken her heart, and adds that she can't stand the thought of dying while Heathcliff is still alive, and wishes that the two of them will never be parted. Then she begs Heathcliff for forgiveness. Heathcliff responds that he forgives her for what she has done to him, but that he can never forgive her for what she has done to herself. He says, I love my murderer, but yours? How can I? Just then Edgar arrives from the church. Heathcliff gives, gets up to leave, but Catherine begs him to stay and he does. As Edgar approaches, Nellie screams. Catherine collapses and Heathcliff catches her. Edgar rushes into the room. Heathcliff puts Catherine's body into Edgar's arms and commands Edgar that it is more important for him to take care of Catherine rather than get angry. Nellie ushers Heathcliff from the room, promising to send news of Catherine's health in the morning. Heathcliff says he'll stay nearby in the garden. Chapter 16 At midnight, Catherine gives birth to a daughter, Cathy, two months prematurely. Catherine dies two hours later. When Nellie brings Heathcliff the news, he seems somehow to already know. He curses Catherine for the pain she has caused, then begs her to haunt and torment him for the rest of his life, even if it drives him mad, just so that they can be together. Edgar keeps watch over Catherine's body day and night, while Heathcliff stays out in the garden through the night. Eventually, exhaustion forces Edgar to leave Catherine's side for a few hours and Nellie allows Heathcliff to see the body. After Heathcliff leaves, Nellie discovers that Heathcliff has replaced a lock of Edgar's hair that Catherine kept in a locket with his own hair. Nellie finds Edgar's lock of hair and twines the two together in the locket. Hindley does not attend Catherine's funeral, though he is invited. Isabella is not invited. The nearby villagers are surprised when Edgar doesn't bury Catherine in the Linton tomb, 
but instead by a wall in the corner of the churchyard, with a view of the moors she loved. Nelly then tells Lockwood that Edgar is buried next to Catherine. Chapter 17 Just a few days after the funeral, Isabella comes to Thrushcross Grange at a time when she knows Edgar will be asleep in his room. Disheveled and laughing hysterically, Isabella tells Nelly, who is taking care of the baby, Cathy, that she knows Edgar won't allow her to stay, but, but that she needs Nelly's help. Isabella tells Nelly that Hindi desperately tried to stay sober in order to attend Catherine's funeral, but fell apart the morning of the funeral and started drinking. Then, while Heathcliff was out standing vigil at Catherine's grave, Hindley locked the doors of Wuthering Heights to keep Heathcliff out and told Isabella that he planned to shoot Heathcliff. When Heathcliff returned, Isabella warned him of Hindley's plans, but didn't let him into the house. Hindley then tried to shoot Heathcliff from a first-floor window, but Heathcliff wrenched away the end of the gun and in the process wounded Hindley in the wrist with the blade of the gun's bayonet. Heathcliff then broke into the house through that window and beat Hindley. The next morning, Hindley did not remember what had happened, but Isabella reminded him. The two men once again fell to fighting, at which point Isabella ran to Thrushcross Grange. Nellie then jumps a bit ahead in her story to say that after leaving Thrushcross Grange, Isabella went to live near London, where she gave birth to a sickly boy, whom she named Linton. Heathcliff eventually learned where Isabella and his son were, but did not go after them. Isabella died when Linton was 12. Hindi died six months after Catherine, and Nellie goes to Wuthering Heights to look after the funeral and to bring Hareton back to the Grange. But Nellie is shocked to learn that Hindley died deep in debt to Heathcliff, who now owns Wuthering Heights. In addition, Heathcliff refuses to let Hareton leave Wuthering Heights and implies that he eventually plans to bring Linton to Wuthering Heights as well. Nellie then adds that Hareton, who should be the master of Wuthering Heights, now is forced to live as dependent and servant to Heathcliff. Chapter 18 Cathy grows into a beautiful, smart, inquisitive and willful 13-year-old. Edgar doesn't allow her, allow her to leave Thrushcross Grange unattended, however, so she is entirely unaware of Wuthering Heights or anyone who lives there. One day, she hears of some fairy caves at nearby Penistone Crags and begs Edgar to take her, but Edgar refuses, since to get there, they would have to pass Wuthering Heights. Soon after, though, Edgar learns that Isabella is dying, and rushes off to London to bring Linton back to the Grange. While he's gone, Cathy manages to escape Nelly and the grounds of the Grange. She heads off toward Penistone Crags, but meets Hareton along the way and immediately likes him. The two spend the day playing together. Nelly chases after Cathy and soon finds her at Wuthering Heights. Cathy refuses to leave when Nelly tells her to. However, she wants to stay with Hareton. Cathy's interest in Hareton turned to contempt, though when she learns from Nellie that Hareton isn't the son of the master of Wuthering Heights. Cathy starts to order Hareton around, who, much to her surprise and indignation, curses back at her. A servant of Wuthering Heights then reveals that Hareton is actually Cathy's cousin. Catherine denies it with the argument that her father has gone to get her real cousin, who is the son of a gentleman from London. Unhappy that the news of Edgar's trip to get Linton has been made public, Nellie hushes Cathy by saying that the person can have many cousins of all sorts of stations in life. Finally, Nellie and Cathy leave. On the trip back to Grange, Cathy agrees not to tell Edgar about her trip to Wuthering Heights, since the news might anger Edgar so much that he would fire Nellie. Chapter 19 Edgar and Linton arrive at the Grange. Linton resembles Edgar, but is weak and whiny. Cathy treats him like a pet or baby, kissing his forehead and stroking his hair. Edgar tells Nellie that he believes that if Linton is allowed to stay at Thrushcross Grange, he will get stronger because in Cathy, he has a playmate his own age. But that night, Joseph arrives from Wuthering Heights, demanding Linton. Edgar says he will bring Linton to Heathcliff in the morning. Chapter 20 Nellie takes Linton to Wuthering Heights the next morning. To make the fearful Linton feel better, Nellie assures him of, Heathful, of Heathcliff's goodness. 
that Heathcliff proves Nellie is lying from the moment he appears. He refers to Linton as his property. He calls Is Isabella a wicked slut and admits he wants Linton not because he loves him, but because he wants to use him to get Thrushcross Grange. Linton begs Nellie not to leave him with Heathcliff, but she can do nothing but ride away. Chapter 21 At first, Cathy is despondent about Linton's departure. As time passes, though she asks about Linton less and less. Meanwhile, Nellie keeps tabs on Linton by questioning the Wuthering Heights housekeeper and learns that Linton remains weak and whiny and that Heathcliff can't stand him. One day, three years later, Linton goes to Wuthering Heights. The 16-year-old Catherine and Nellie go bird hunting on the moors. Cathy runs ahead of Nellie and when Nellie catches up, she finds Catherine speaking with Heathcliff and Hareton. Catherine says that she thinks she's met Hareton before and wonders if he's Heathcliff's son. Heathcliff says no, but that he does have a son whom Catherine has met before and invites Cathy and Nellie to come back to Wuthering Heights with him. Nellie suspects Heathcliff is plotting something. But Cathy is intrigued and Nellie has no choice but to go along with her to the heights. At the house, Heathcliff tells Nellie that he hopes Linton and Cathy will one day marry. Yet Cathy and Linton don't even recognise each other when they meet. Linton is now taller than Cathy, but he is still so sickly and weak that he can't even show Cathy around the house. So she goes off with Hareton instead. Heathcliff demands that Linton go after them. Before they move out of earshot, Nellie hears Cathy mocking Hareton for being illiterate. The next day, Cathy confronts Edgar about why he has kept her relatives at Wuthering Heights a secret from her. Edgar tries to carefully explain, and though Cathy doesn't entirely understand, he does manage to get across how much he despises Heathcliff. Edgar also asks his daughter not to have any contact with Linton, but Cathy doesn't listen and she and Linton begin writing secret letters to each other. Nellie eventually finds Linton's letters and over Cathy's objections destroys them. Cathy ends the correspondence with Linton and Nellie doesn't say anything about the letters to Edgar. Chapter 22 That winter Edgar falls ill and Nellie becomes Cathy's main companion. One day as the two walk in the garden, Cathy climbs the wall in an effort to get some fruit. In the process, her hat falls over the wall. Cathy, with Nellie's permission, climbs down the wall to get it, but then finds herself unable to climb back. As Nellie searches for a key to the gate in the wall, Heathcliff appears. He admonishes Cathy for ending her correspondence with Linton, adding that he suspects she was cruelly playing with Linton. He then says that he will be away from Wuthering Heights for a week and that she should visit Linton who he thinks may be dying of a broken heart. Cathy feels so guilty that she decides to go to Wuthering Heights the next morning. Nellie agrees to go only because she thinks the sight of Linton will show Cathy that Heathcliff is lying. Chapter 23 Cathy and Nellie lie, ride to Wuthering Heights the next morning in the rain. There they find Linton who whines about the servants and complains about Cathy not coming to visit him before. Linton then brings up the possibility of marriage. Cathy gets annoyed at this and shoves Linton's chair, which sends Linton into a spasm of coughing. Linton says that Catherine has assaulted him and worsened his already frail condition. Doing his best to make Catherine feel guilty, he then asks her to nurse him back to health herself. Nellie and Cathy return to Thrushcross Grange, where Nellie comes down with the cold from her riding to Wuthering Heights and back in the rain. Catherine dutifully nurses both Nellie and her father by day. By night, she takes the opportunity to secretly go to Wuthering Heights to see Linton. Chapter 24 When Nellie recovers, she quickly notices Cathy's suspicious behaviour and soon catches Cathy sneaking into her room after a night out. After feebly trying to lie, Cathy admits that she's been going to Wuthering Heights to see Linton. In particular, Cathy tells Nellie of one trip to Wuthering Heights where Hareton stops her and proves to her that he could read the name Hareton written above the house front door. Cathy, though, asks him if he can read the number next to the word. It says 1,500. When Hareton admits that he can't, 
she once again mocks him for his stupidity. Furious, Hareton later barges in on Cathy's visit with Linton and forces the weak, snivelling Linton to go upstairs. A bit later, Hareton feels remorse and apologises to Cathy for his actions, but she refuses to speak to him and returns to Thrushcross Grange. Cathy returns to the Heights three days later, but immediately leaves when Linton blames her for the humiliation had enforced on him. Cathy returns two days later to tell Linton that she has decided never to visit him again. Distraught, Linton begs for forgiveness. As soon as Cathy finishes her story, Nellie goes to Edgar and tells him everything. Edgar forbids Cathy from ever again visiting Linton at Wuthering Heights, but does agree to allow Linton to visit the Grange. Chapter 25 Nellie pauses in her narrative to tell Lockwood that the events she is now describing took place a little over a year ago, during the previous winter. She notes how odd it is to be telling the story to a stranger, though she wonders if Lockwood might fall in love with Cathy and thereby cease to be a stranger. Lockwood agrees that he just might fall in love with Cathy, but adds that she is unlikely to return the feeling and that anyway, He'll have to leave soon because the Moors aren't his home. He asks Nellie to continue the story, and she does. Obeying her father's wishes, Cathy ceases to visit Linton. But Linton also does not visit the Grange because he's too weak to make the trip. Eventually, Edgar decides that his daughter's happiness is the most important. And he says that if she visit- wishes, Cathy may marry Linton, even though that would mean Heathcliff would definitely inherit the Grange. As he falls further into illness, Edgar agrees to let Cathy visit Linton, though he asks that she meet him not at Wuthering Heights but on the moors. However, Nellie further explains to Lockwood, Edgar didn't know that Linton was almost as close to death as Edgar himself. Chapter 26 Cathy and Nellie ride to the location on the moors where they are to meet Linton, but he's not there. Instead, they find him nearby Wuthering Heights. He appears even weaker than usual, but he insists that he is in fact getting stronger. Linton seems anxious during the entire visit and keeps glancing over his shoulder at Wuthering Heights. As the visit ends, Cathy promises to meet Linton in the same place the following Thursday. As they travel home, Cathy and Nellie discuss how much more ill Linton seems, but decide that they'll have to wait until the next visit to get a real sense of his health. Chapter 27 Edgar's health continues to fail over the following week. Though she doesn't want to leave her sick father alone, Cathy rides with Nellie to see Linton on the moors. Linton is even more nervous during this meeting than the last one, and admits that his father is pushing him to woo Cathy. He also says that he's frightened of what Heathcliff would do to him if she doesn't marry him. As they talk, Heathcliff arrives. He asks Nellie that Edgar's health and also tells her privately that he worries that Linton will die before Edgar does. Heathcliff then asks Cathy and Nellie to return to Wuthering Heights with him. Cathy tells him that she is forbidden by her father to go to Heights, but agrees to go anyway because Linton is terrified to return to the house without her. At Wuthering Heights, Heathcliff locks Nellie and Cathy inside the house and says that they won't be allowed to leave until Cathy and Linton marry. He locks Nellie and Cathy in a bedroom that night. The next day, he lets Cathy out of the bedroom, but not out of Wuthering Heights, and keeps Nellie locked in the room under the guard of Hareton. This continues for five days. Chapter 28 On the fifth day, Zila, the housekeeper, frees Nellie from the bedroom and tells her that the village is awash in gossip that Nellie and Cathy have been lost in the marshes. Nellie searches the house for Cathy, but instead finds Linton. He tells her that Cathy has been locked up in another room and that he and Cathy are married. Then he exults that he owns all of Cathy's inheritance since Edgar is close to death. Nellie rushes from Wuthering Heights back to Thrushcross Grange. She tells the dying Edgar that Cathy is safe and will soon be back at the Grange. She then sends a group of servants to Wuthering Heights to get Cathy, but they fail and return without her. Meanwhile, in order to keep Cathy's inheritance from Heathcliff, Edgar decides to place the inheritance in the hands of trustees. He sends for his lawyer, Mr. Green, so he can change his will. A while later, Nellie hears someone arrive. 
She thinks that it, it's Mr. Green, but it's actually Cathy who has escaped Wuthering Heights with the help of Linton. Cathy goes to Edgar and spends a few moments with him before he dies. Edgar dies content, believing that Cathy is happily married to Linton. Mr. Green arrives that evening. He takes over the house and dismisses all of the servants but Nelly. He also tries to have Edgar buried in the chapel, but Nelly intervenes, knowing that Edgar states that he wanted to be buried next to his wife. Chapter 29 After Edgar's funeral, Heathcliff comes to the grounds to bring Cathy back to Wuthering Heights. He says that he has punished Linton for helping Cathy escape and that he expects Cathy to work to earn her keep at Wuthering Heights. Cathy responds that she and Linton love each other, while Heathcliff is loveless alone. She adds that however miserable you might make us, we shall still have the revenge of thinking that your cruelty arises from your greater misery. As Cathy backs, Nellie asks Heathcliff to let her be the housekeeper at Wuthering Heights because she wants to stay with Cathy. Heathcliff doesn't answer, instead telling Nellie that while the sexton was digging Edgar's grave, Heathcliff bribed the man to dig up Catherine's grave and remove the wall of a coffin that faced away from Edgar's grave. He then says that when he dies, he'll be buried on that side of Catherine's grave, with the facing wall of his own coffin also removed. He adds that Catherine's ghost has haunted him for the 18 years since she died, but that he could never reach her, as they leave Cathy and asks Nellie to visit her at Wuthering Heights. But Heathcliff tells Nellie never to come to the Heights, and that if he needs her, he'll come to her to, at the Grange. Chapter 30 Nellie tells Lockwood that she hasn't seen Cathy since that day, and only gets news about her from Zela. Heathcliff forbade anyone at the Heights to be kind to Cathy, and made her nurse Linton herself until he died. After Linton's death, Cathy refuses to spend time with Zela or Hareton. Nellie wishes Cathy could come live with her in a cottage Nellie has taken, but knows it will never happen. She says that only another marriage could save Cathy, but such a thing seems impossible. In his diary, Lockwood writes that Nellie has finished the story. He says that he has recovered from his illness and will soon ride to Wuthering Heights to tell Heathcliff that he will be leaving Thrushcross Grange and going to London, where he will be free of the strange people of the Grange and Heights. Chapter 31 Lockwood goes to Wuthering Heights to tell Heathcliff of his decision to leave Thrushcross Grange. He also carries a letter to Cathy from Nellie, but Hareton intercepts it before he can give it to her. When Cathy starts to cry, Hareton returns the letter. Lockwood also learns that Heathcliff has taken Cathy's books. Cathy adds that Hareton has gathered some of her favourite books and tries to read them, but she mocks his faulty efforts. Hareton, ashamed, gathers the books and throws them in the fire. Heathcliff returns and says as soon as he enters that Hareton bears such a striking resemblance to Catherine that it causes him physical and emotional pain even to look at Hareton. After a rather dull and unpleasant meal, Lockwood leaves. On the way back to the grange, he muses on how lucky Cathy would have been had she fallen in love with him and let him take her away to a more pleasant place than Wuthering Heights. Chapter 32 Six months later, Lockwood returns to the area and pays a visit at Wuthering Heights. He finds to his surprise that, that Nellie now lives there. She tells him about what happened after he left. Two weeks after Lockwood left, Zila finds a new job and Heathcliff asks Nellie to take her place. Soon after Nellie arrives, Cathy admits to her that she feels guilty for mocking Hareton. One day, Hareton accidentally shoots himself while working and Cathy has to tend to him. At first they argue often but eventually they come to an understanding and start to get along. Cathy gives Hareton a gift of a book and promises to teach him to read and not to mock him. Nellie says that the two have come to love each other and looks forward to an eventual marriage between them. Chapter 33 The morning after Cathy gives Hareton the book, she and Heathcliff get into an argument at breakfast over her in inheritance. Hareton takes her side. Heathcliff grabs Cathy and nearly hits her, but then suddenly lets, lets her go. Her eyes remind him of Catherine 
that same night, he sees Cathy and Hatton sitting together, and they both remind him of Catherine. All of these reminders of Catherine torment him, and he admits to Nelly that he no longer much cares about taking out his revenge on Cathy and Hatton. Chapter 34 Heathcliff withdraws from the world and eats just one meal a day. A few nights later, he spends the entire night walking outside. When he returns to Wuthering Heights, Cathy remarks that he is actually acting pleasantly. He tells Nelly that last night I was on the threshold of hell. Today I am within sight of my heaven. Heathcliff refuses all food and demands that he be left entirely alone. The next morning at breakfast, Heathcliff terrifies Nelly when he seems to see an apparition. She can see nothing, but it seems to her that Heathcliff is communicating with it. That night, Heathcliff again seems to be speaking with a ghost. Nelly hears him say, Catherine. When Nelly speaks with Heathcliff, he reminds her of his burial wishes. The next day, Heathcliff locks himself into his room and refuses to even see the doctor. The next morning, Nelly uses another key to get into the room and finds Heathcliff dead and soaking wet. He had thrown open the window to let the rain come down on him. Character Analysis Mr. Lockwood He is a gentleman who rents Thrushcross Grange from Heathcliff. He is the narrator of the story. Nellie Dean tells him about all of the other characters and he passes on her account to the reader. He is a somewhat smug and emotionally remote city boy who is not very involved into the action. Nellie Dean She is the housekeeper to the Earnshaws and Lintons. The novel is from her point of view. We see every character aside from Lockwood through her eyes. She grows up with Hindley, Catherine and Heathcliff and works at both Woodring Heights and Thrushcross Grange. Nellie is confidant to many including both Catherine's, Isabella and even Heathcliff. She cares for Hatton when he is an infant and is a mother figure to the younger Cathy. Though a servant, she is educated and articulate. Frequently, she does more than observe. She becomes very involved in her employer's lives. Some might call her meddlesome, but most of the characters are so comfortable with her that they have intimate conversations in front of her. Hindley Earnshaw, son of Mr. Earnshaw, brother of Catherine, foster brother of Heathcliff, father of Hareton, husband of Francis. He inherits Wuthering Heights from his father. A hardcore drinker and gambler, he falls apart after his wife's death. He evolves from being a fun-loving, good-natured boy into an angry, bitter, jealous and self-destructive man. Catherine Earnshaw Linton, daughter of Mr. Earnshaw, Sister of Hindley, foster sister and true love of Heathcliff, wife of Edgar, mother of Cathy. Gorgeous and fiery with dark curls and penetrating eyes, Catherine is a woman in conflict. She craves the luxury, security and serenity of ultra-civilised Edgar, even as she rolls wild across the moors with brooding and unkempt Heathcliff. She loves Heathcliff with a huge and overwhelming passion. She is impetuous, proud, and sometimes haughty. Heathcliff, foster son of Mr. Earnshaw, foster brother of Hindley and Catherine, husband of Isabella, and father of Linton. Heathcliff is the conflicted villain and hero of the novel. Mr. Earnshaw finds him on the street and brings him home to Wuthering Heights, where he and Catherine become soulmates. He is the ultimate outsider with his dark gypsy looks and mysterious background. Though he eventually comes to own Wuthering Heights, he never seems as fully home in the house as he does on the moors. His love for Catherine is gigantic and untamed and matters to him more than anything else. But it is never easy. It leads him to control and belittle and manipulate nearly everyone around him. Despite his many horrible deeds, Heathcliff is not a straight-out bad guy. He is a poor orphan who finds material success, but not what he really wants, the love of Catherine. Catherine or Cathy Linton Heathcliff Earnshaw Daughter of Edgar and Catherine, wife of Linton Heathcliff and Hurton Earnshaw. 
Young, beautiful and good-hearted, Kathy has the gumption and passion of a mother and the calm and blonde beauty of a father. She is a complicated teenager who is frequently kind and compassionate, but often also selfish and inconsiderate. Ultimately, she so shows the capacity to see past superficial things to the nobility and beauty beneath, a trait her mother lacked. Hareton Earnshaw, son of Hindley and Francis, husband of young Cathy. Hareton lives and works at Wuthering Heights where his father ignores him and Heathcliff tolerates him. He is shy, rough, illiterate, hard-working and neglected. By birth, he should be a gentleman, but his guardians purposely neglect his education. Underneath his gruffness is a smart, kind and sensitive soul. Edgar Linton, brother of Isabella, husband of Catherine, father of Cathy. Sweet, loving and kind, Edgar is the picture of a country gentleman. He is very handsome and dotes upon both wife and daughter. He initially appears fragile, but in fact he is quite strong in a quiet, introspective way. He is not pure goodness, however. He despises Heathcliff and can be unforgiving. Mr. Earnshaw is a gentleman farmer. He is father to Hindley and Catherine. Out of kindness, he takes in Heathcliff an orphan. He is stern and alienates his biological son by showing interest in Heathcliff. By the time of his death, he has little control over any of his children. Francis Earnshaw Hindley's wife and Hareton's mother Frances is a minor character and meets Hindley away from Wuthering Heights. She arrives at Wuthering Heights full of enthusiasm but dies soon after giving birth to her son. Isabella Linton is sister of Edgar, wife of Heathcliff and mother of Linton. Beautiful and fair, she is raised to be a dainty, delicate lady. She is no match for Heathcliff who marries her for her claim on Thrushcross Grange rather than for her love. Linton Heathcliff is son of Heathcliff and Isabella, husband of young Catherine. Though lovely looking, Linton is sickly, whiny, effeminate and weak. Joseph, long time servant at Wuthering Heights. He is very religious and judgmental. Joseph speaks in a very thick dialect. Zilla is a housekeeper at Wuthering Heights. Moving on to the theme analysis. Gothic literature and the supernatural. From beginning to end, Wuthering Heights is a novel full of ghosts and spirits. Dead characters refuse to leave the living alone and the living accept that the deceased find ways of coming back to haunt them. In a departure from traditional Gothic tales, these hauntings are sometimes welcome. Heathcliff, for instance, repeatedly seeks out visitations from the ghost of his beloved Catherine. He even digs up her grave in order to be closer to her. Bronte uses otherworldly figures to emphasize the ferocity of Heathcliff's and Catherine's love. Their connection is so powerful that even death can't stop them. Nature and Civilization Bidding nature against civilization, Emily Bronte prom promotes the romantic idea that the sublime, the awe inspiring, almost frightening beauty of nature is superior to man made culture. She makes this point by correlating many of the characters with one side or the other and then squaring them off against each other. For instance, Heathcliff, whose origins are unknown and who roams the moors, is definitely on the nature side, while his rival, the studious Edgar Linton, is in the civilised camp. Other pairings include Hareton Earnshaw vs Linton Earnshaw, Catherine vs Isabella and Hareton vs Cathy. In all of these cases, Bronte makes one character a bit wild, perhaps by showing them in tune with animals and outdoors or their emotions, while portraying the other as somewhat reserved and often prissy or fussy. But nothing is black and white in Wuthering Heights. Many of the characters exhibit traits from both sides. While Bronte argues that nature is somehow purer, she also lauds civilization, particularly in terms of education. Hareton Earnshaw personifies this combination of nature and civilization. Bronte associates the young orphan with nature. He is a coarse, awkward farm boy, as well as civilization. Inspired by his desire for young Cathy, he learns how to read. This mixture of down-to-earth passion and book-centered education make him arguably the most sympathetic character in the book.
the theme of love and passion. The novel Wuthering Heights explores a variety of kinds of love. Loves on display in the novel include Heathcliff and Catherine's all-consuming passion for each other, which while noble in its purity, is also terribly destructive. In contrast, the love between Catherine and Edgar is proper and civilized rather than passionate. Theirs is a love of peace and comfort, a socially acceptable love but it can't stand in the way of Heathcliff and Catherine's more profound and more violent connection. The love between Cathy and Linton is a grotesque exaggeration of that between Catherine and Edgar. While Catherine always seems just a bit too strong for Edgar, Cathy and Linton's love is founded on Linton's weakness. Linton gets Cathy to love him by playing on a desire to protect and mother him. Finally, there is the love between Cathy and Hareton, which seems to balance the traits of the other loves on display. They have the passion of Catherine and Heathcliff without the destructiveness, and the gentleness shared by Edgar and Catherine without the dullness or inequality in power. Masculinity and Femininity Written when gender roles were far more rigid and defined than they are now, Wuthering Heights examines stereotypes of masculinity and femininity. Emily Bronte constantly contrasts masculinity and femininity, but not all of the comparisons are simple. Sometimes boys act like girls, and girls act like boys. Edgar Linton and Linton Heathcliff, for instance, are men. But Bronte frequently describes them as having the looks and attributes of women. Likewise, Catherine Earnshaw has many masculine characteristics. Even though she is outrageously beautiful, she loves rough, outdoor play and can hold her own in any fight. She is a complex mix of hyper-feminine grace and loveliness and ultra-masculine anger and recklessness. Heathcliff, with his physical and mental toughness, has no such ambiguities. He is exaggeratedly masculine and scorns his wife Isabella for her overblown femininity. Emily Bronte seems to favour masculinity over femininity, even in her women. In general, she portrays weak, delicate characters with contempt, while she treats strong and rugged characters like Heathcliff, both Catherine's and Hareton, with compassion and admiration, despite their flaws. The theme of class Understanding the importance of class in 18th and 19th century Britain is essential to understanding Wuthering Heights. Generally, at the time, people were born into a class and stayed within it. If your parents were rich and respected, like Edgar's, you would be too. If your parents were servants, like Nellie Dean's, you probably would be too. Social mobility, the idea that you can change your class status, usually for the better, was not commonplace. In Bronte's novel, however, class disti distinctions are constantly changing, much to the confusion of the characters. There are two primary examples of this, Heathcliff and Hareton. Because no one knows anything about Heathcliff's background, they all treat him differently. Mr. Earnshaw adopts him and treats him like a son. But the snobby Lintons refuse to socialise with him. When he disappears for a few years and comes back rich, the characters struggle even more over how to approach him. He now has money and land, but many of them still consider him a farm boy. Likewise. Hareton has a hard time gaining respect. The son of Hindley, Hareton should be the heir to Wuthering Heights. With land and standing, he ought to be a gentleman. However, Heathcliff refuses to educate him and everyone else mostly ignores him. So his manners, a very important indicator of class status, are rough and gruff. Only when young Cathy helps educate him does he achieve the class standing to which he was born. Revenge and Repetition Nearly all of the action in Wuthering Heights results from one or the other actor's desire for revenge. The result are cycles of revenge that seem to endlessly repeat. Hinde takes revenge on Heathcliff for taking his place at Wuthering Heights by denying him an education, and in the process separates Heathcliff and Catherine. Heathcliff then takes revenge upon Hinde by first dispossessing Hinde of Wuthering Heights, and then by denying an education to Hareton, Hinde's son. Heathcliff also seeks revenge on Edgar for marrying Catherine by marrying Catherine by marrying Cathy to Linton. 
Yet while Heathcliff's revenge is effective, it seems to bring him little joy. Later on in the novel, Cathy sees this and tells Heathcliff that her revenge on him, no matter how miserable he makes her, is to know that he, Heathcliff, is more miserable. And it is instructive that only when Heathcliff loses his desire for revenge is he able to finally reconnect with Catherine in death. And to allow Cathy and Hatton, who are so similar to Heathcliff and Catherine, to find love and marry. Moving on to symbol analysis. Wuthering Heights, the childhood home of many of the book's characters, that is Heathcliff, Catherine, Hindley, Nellie Dean, and Herdon. Wuthering Heights is a centuries old farmhouse that symbolizes simplicity, wildness, and passion. Sturdy, substantial, and stubborn, the house is at one with the surrounding moose. It is fierce but unchanging. Its inhabitants share its characteristics. Like it or not, they are in touch with their raw, natural and animalistic instincts. Wuthering Heights thus stands for unfettered, primal emotions. It is nature. Thrushgrass Grange Thrushgrass Grange, the house owned by the Lintons and then inhabited by Lockwood, is a symbol of tamed, refined, civilised culture. Even when Heathcliff owns it, he chooses to rent it rather than live in it for its formality does not suit the likes of him. In contrast to Wuthering Heights, the grant stands for manners and civility. It is an outpost of education and urbanity in the midst of the wildness of the northern English moors. The weather. The frequent storms and wind that sweep through Wuthering Heights symbolize how the characters are at the mercy of forces they cannot control. For example, Lockwood, the city boy thinks he can walk back to Thrushcross Grange through a storm. But the nature-respecting folks at Wuthering Heights tell him he's crazy. They know that the weather, or nature, is far stronger than he is. Bronte uses the weather as a metaphor for nature, which he portrays as a magnificently strong force that can conquer any character. The strongest characters are those who give the weather the respect it deserves. Moving on to a short biography about the author. Emily Bronte, full name, Emily Jane Bronte. Birth date, 30 July 1818, born in Thornton, Yorkshire, England. She died on 19th December 1848 in Haworth, Yorkshire, England. Emily Bronte is best known for authoring the novel Wuthering Heights. She was the sister of Charlotte and Anne Bronte, also famous authors. Born in Thornton, Yorkshire, England, on 30th July 1818, Emily Jane Bronte lived a quiet life in Yorkshire with a clergyman father, brother Branwell Bronte and two sisters, Charlotte and Anne. The sisters enjoyed writing poetry and novels, which they published under pseudonyms. As Alice Bell, Emily wrote Wuthering Heights in 1847, her only published novel, which garnered wide critical and commercial acclaim. Emily Bronte died in Haworth, Yorkshire, the same year that her brother, Branwell, passed away in 1848. Emily Bronte was not the only creative talent in her family. Her sisters, Charlotte and Anne, enjoyed some literary success as well. Her father had published several works during his lifetime as well. Emily was the fifth child of Reverend Patrick Bronte and his wife, Maria Branwell Bronte. The family moved to Haworth in April 1821. Only a few months later, Bronte's mother died of cancer. Her death came nearly nine months after the birth of her sister Anne. Her mother's sister, Elizabeth Branwell, came to live with the family to help care for the children. At the age of six, Emily was sent to the clergy daughter's school at Cowan Bridge with Charlotte and her two older sisters, Elizabeth and Maria. Both Elizabeth and Maria became seriously ill at school and returned home, where they died of tuberculosis in 1825. Bronte's father removed both Emily and Charlotte from the school as well. At home in Haworth, Bronte enjoyed her quiet life. She read extensively and began to make up stories with her siblings. The surviving Bronte children, which included brother Branwell, had strong imaginations. They created tales inspired by toy soldiers given to Branwell by their father. In 1835, the shy Emily tried leaving home for school. 
She went with Charlotte to Miss Wooler's school in Rowhead, where Charlotte worked as a teacher. But she stayed only a few months before heading back to Haworth. Coming from a poor family, Bronte tried to find work. She became a teacher at the Law Hill School in September 1837, but she left her position the following March. Bronte and her sister Charlotte travelled to Brussels in 1842 to study, but the death of their aunt Elizabeth forced them to return home. Some of Emily's earliest known works involve a fictional world called Gondol, which she created with her sister Anne. She wrote both prose and poems about this imaginary place and its inhabitants. Emily also wrote other poems. Her sister Charlotte discovered some of Emily's poems and sought to publish them along with her own work and some by Anne. The three sisters used male pen names for their collection. Poems by Cura, Ellis and Acton Bell. Published in 1846, the book only sold a few copies and garnered little attention. Again publishing as Ellis Bell, Bronte published her defining work, Wuthering Heights, in December 1847. The complex novel explores two families, the Earnshaws and the Lintons, across two generations and their stately homes, Wuthering Heights and Thrushcross Grange. Heathcliff, an orphan taken in by the Earnshaws, is the driving force between the action in the book. He first, motivated by his love for Catherine Earnshaw, then by his desire for revenge against her, for what he believed to be rejection. At first, reviewers did not know what to make of Wuthering Heights. It was only after Bronte's death that the book developed its reputation as a literary masterwork. She died of tuberculosis on December 19, 1848, nearly two months after her brother Branwell succumbed to the same disease. Emily's sister Anne also fell ill and died of tuberculosis the following May. Interest in Bronte's work and life remains strong today. The parsonage where Bronte spent much of her life is now a museum. The Bronte Society operates the museum and works to preserve and honour the work of the Bronte sisters. Moving on to the literary movement that inspired the writing of Wuthering Heights. Romanticism. Romanticism proper was preceded by several related developments from the mid-18th century that can be termed pre-romanticism. Among such trends was a new appreciation of the medieval romance, from which the Romantic movement derives its name. The romance was a tale or ballad of chivalric adventure, whose emphasis on individual heroism and on the exotic and mysterious was in clear contrast to the elegant formality and artificiality of prevailing classical forms of literature, such as the French neoclassical tragedy or the English heroic couplet in poetry. This new interest in relatively unsophisticated but overtly emotional literary expressions of the past was to be a dominant note in Romanticism. Romanticism in English literature began in the 1790s with the publication of the lyrical ballads of William Wordsworth and Samuel Taylor Coleridge. Wordsworth's preface to the second edition of Lyrical Ballads, in which he described poetry as a spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings became the manifesto of the English Romantic movement in poetry. William Blake was the third principal poet of the movement's early phase in England. The first phase of the Romantic movement in Germany was marked by innovations in both content and literary style, and by a preoccupation with the mystical, the subconscious and the supernatural. The second phase of Romanticism, comprising the period from about 1805 to the 1830s, was marked by a quickening of cultural nationalism and a new attention to national origins, as attested by the collection and imitation of native folklore, folk ballads and poetry, folk dance and music, and even previously ignored medieval and renaissance works. The revived historical appreciation was translated into imaginative writing by Sir Walter Scott, who was often considered to have invented the historical novel. At about the same time, English Romantic poetry had reached its zenith in the works of John Keats, Lord Byron and Percy Shelley. By the 1820s, Romanticism had broadened to embrace the literatures of almost all of Europe. In this later, second phase, the movement was less universal in approach and concentrated more on exploring each nation's historical and cultural inheritance 
and on examining the passions and struggles of exceptional individuals. A brief survey of romantic or romantic influenced writers would have to include Thomas De Quincey, William Hazlitt and the Bronte sisters in England. Romanticism in Wuthering Heights The Romantic period in literature is generally defined as the late 18th century and the first half of the 19th century. Emily Bronte's only novel, Wuthering Heights, published in 1847, is considered a classic of romantic literature. It might sound as if romantic literature is about romantic love, like a contemporary romance novel. However, this is not quite what is meant. Hopefully, this lesson about Wuthering Heights can help with that confusion. One of the key values of the Romantic movement in music, art and literature was the emphasis on the experience of the individual, both the creator of the work and the characters depicted. Characters are often complex and mysterious with dark problems in their past. The goal of Romanticism as a movement was to experience the world with emotional intensity and to transcend the ordinary in everyday life. Characters of Romantic literature include nature and landscape, complex characters, the death and the supernatural. Idea of Romantic Love versus Class Bronte's novel is shaped by the prominence of the Industrial Revolution in England, which had gotten well underway by this point. The Industrial Revolution caused great disruption in the traditional relationships among social classes. Self-made men who had profited greatly from the revolution posed a threat to the dominant standing of the gentry in the upper classes. Although willing to mix socially with manufacturers and industrialists for the sake of profit, the gentry usually resisted marrying into this newly emerging middle class, largely due to perceived differences in breeding. The prominence of distinctions between social classes is materialised by the two properties, Wuthering Heights and Thrushcross Ranch. The less extravagant of the two properties, Wuthering Heights identifies as home for the Earnshaws, who may be categorised as upper middle class due to owning their own land and being waited on by servants. The Earnshaws' position in social class is almost immediately recognised by Lockwood upon his first visit to the Heights, who offers a description of the place and furniture reflecting that of a homely northern farmer. The adjective homely contradicts Lockwood's previous notice of villainous guns hanging from the walls suggesting that the place is fitting for as hostile a character as Heathcliff is. In contrast, Thrushcross Grange is granted a far more regal description, with Heathcliff and Catherine's focus being drawn to the crimson carpets, chairs and tables, as well as the ceiling bordered with gold and hanging glass drop chandeliers. All of these assets are indicative of the great wealth of the family who live there, the Lintons. Importantly, the description offered by the prestigious Thrushcross Grange is mostly enabled by Heathcliff and Cathy's observations from the window, whereas far more detail is able to be offered about the interior of the lesser Wuthering Heights. The physical barriers of the closed windows and doors of the Grange that greatly limit access for the upper middle class Catherine and entirely forbid access for Heathcliff as part of the working class can be, inter can be interpreted as representative of the social immobility and restricted merging between classes. This division is made explicit in Chapter 6, where the Lintons take Catherine in but refuse Heathcliff, forcing him to find his way back from the Grange alone. Just as social class forces division between Catherine and Heathcliff as children, it continues to do so years later. Despite Catherine's confession to Nellie of a lasting love for Heathcliff, she is insistent that his lesser social standing prevents Heathcliff from being a suitable husband for her. It would degrade me to marry Heathcliff, she said. Contextual understanding is essential in preventing a modern reader from interpreting Catherine's response as a shallow excuse. In this period, to marry outside of social class was seen to betray and dishonour one's family. And was, a cause for, and was a cause for women to be completely outcast and rejected by the ones they loved. At a time when women were typically unable to own property and other financial assets themselves, financial dependence on their fathers often ruled out marrying a man who did not meet the approval of the family, as doing so would put their financial security at risk. 
as Heathcliff's working class position as a manual labourer renders him unable to offer her this financial security, Catherine attempts to dismiss her love for Heathcliff, instead opting to marry Edgar Linton for the social comforts he is able to offer her. The difficulty of overlooking the importance of social class in favour of genuine passion and the emotional turmoil involved in doing so translates through so many later novels, including Ian McEwan's Atonement, published in 2001, over 50 years after the publication of Wuthering Heights. In Atonement, Cecilia's upper-class social standing sets her apart from her childhood friend Robbie Turner, who has sustained genuine love and adoration for her. Although not outrightly prohibiting a relationship to occur between the two, Robbie's inherited lesser position as son of the Tannis' housekeeper sets him at a disadvantage with the privileged Cecilia. So, that's all for now. If you found this video useful, we would really love it if you could give it a thumbs up. Also, do subscribe to our channel where we offer lots of free material that you can use as part of your studies to get a better understanding of specific areas that you might find challenging. Also, if you need more information, either on this novel or more generally for other areas in your course, make sure to visit our website, which is www.firstratetutors.com. There you will find useful revision guides, model answers and tools that you can use to get top marks in your coursework or exams. Thank you for listening.